Yo Bar, what's up and what's happening and welcome back to it's the Yo Bar series with me, Chris Arning. So today I want to quickly discuss type 2 diabetes and give you an overview of the clients that I work with, but also give you some information about type 2 diabetes, the medications of type 2 diabetes, the side effects of type 2 diabetes, and then also things that you can do after this video to be able to help you better your health and also control your type 2 diabetes. Now, as a little side note, for those of you who don't have type 2 diabetes, but you are perhaps someone who's got pre-diabetes or even high blood sugar and you, and you know that to be true, perhaps even you're someone who's struggling with overall weight, I feel that this video would actually really help you. So if you are one of those people and also you're a type 2 diabetic, then I want you to stay tuned. So let's begin. A question that you might be asking yourself is, what is type 2 diabetes? Well, for me, as a nutritionist and diabetic coach, I feel that diabetes falls into four categories or what I call the four red flags. Those four red flags are as follows. They are high blood sugar, a fatty liver, a fatty pancreas, and also hyperinsulinemia. And I'm going to break all of those down for you. So let's go to high blood sugar first because it's the easiest one to talk about. High blood sugar is basically when there is too much glycogen in the body. And if you can imagine you have a red blood cell, your red blood cell is responsible for delivering nutrition or macronutrients and micronutrients in and around the body. It's also responsible for being able to deliver and take away oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if you think of my hand here as a blood cell and you have an oxygen molecule that binds and attaches itself to that blood cell, what that blood cell does is it travels around the body and it delivers oxygen to the muscle tissue that needs oxygen and as a transaction it gives over carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is deoxygenated blood and that goes all the way back out to the lungs to be expelled and that's pretty much the cycle. However, when you've got high blood sugar, if you could think of this blood cell as by hand here and you wrap around a film of sticky substance, almost a bit like honey, then what happens is that acts as a barrier and it prevents and stops oxygen attaching itself to that red blood cell. So what you've now got is you've got a blood cell that's kind of deactivated in a way and it's not doing its entire job. It's not, it's not oxygenated rich blood anymore. And it's the same for when it needs to start picking up more carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a byproduct of burning energy, basically. It's burning oxygen and glycogen together. And so because of that, it also doesn't take the, or it doesn't take it away fast enough. It doesn't take carbon dioxide away fast enough. So what happens is, is you're starting to starve the muscle tissue. Gangrene comes from basically dead tissue that just hasn't been fed oxygen and it's just started to die off. So the first major red flag for me with people with type 2 diabetes is addressing their high blood sugar. So high blood sugar is also dangerous because it helps spike a certain hormone, which if it's spiked too many times can become detrimental to you. So we spoke about high blood sugar. We spoke about, or we're going to discuss the pancreas and we're going to discuss the liver. But I'm actually going to go to the, the fourth red flag first. The fourth red flag is what we call hyperinsulinemia. When you break it down, it's hyper, which means a lot of, insulin which is the name of the hormone and emia is basically latin for blood so hyperinsulinemia or too much insulin in the blood or too much insulin at any given time generally because of someone's habits their diet the type of food that they're eating whether they're eating ultra processed or highly processed food and they're consuming a lot of refined grains and refined sugars and they're eating or they're consuming energy such as calories on a very frequent basis. Anytime that happens, insulin has to be spiked. So hyperinsulinemia is another red flag that I look for when I'm dealing with my type 2 diabetic clients. So high blood sugar will lead to hyperinsulinemia and same vice versa. 
insulin, what insulin's job is as a hormone is to lower blood sugar down. So it's not to spike blood sugar, it's, it's the opposite. So if you can imagine that you eat, let's say, a candy bar or a chocolate bar, when you consume that, because it's refined, because it's refined, it's a refined sugar, the body assimilates it very, very quickly. And because of that, it has this side effect where it spikes your insulin very high. With whole food, on the other hand, just briefly, if you were to consume whole food, it wouldn't spike insulin as quickly and it wouldn't spike it as high. So when you're consuming a refined food, which has basically got refined sugar in it, it's going to naturally spike that insulin and the, uh, sorry, it's going to naturally spike your sh blood sugar levels. And that is then going to trigger insulin, which is then going to bring it back down. And it brings it back down below what we call baseline. So you have a, a baseline level of hormone at all times. But if the hormone's interrupted, the body brings it back down, but it brings it below baseline. It kind of almost over works to do that so the gradual incline back up to normal baseline takes a long time so you can see that there's a wave there so hyperinsulinemia is the second red flag that i would look for when i'm dealing with type 2 diabetics okay so we've discussed high blood sugar and then we've also skipped to hyperinsulinemia which is the fourth one but the other two middle ones are to do with the organs so let's go to the pancreas first the pancreas is there to produce two hormones that is insulin and that's also another hormone called glucagon now insulin is there to lower blood sugar and glucagon is there to raise blood sugar when blood sugar levels get too low again when you go back to diets and habit and types of food that an individual chooses to eat it kind of tends to spike the insulin too high and then the glucagon has to bring things back up when there is too much there is too little blood sugar in in the bloodstream so basically what's happening is there's a constant spike of up and down up and down up and down and because it's being spiked too many times that basically means that the person becomes resistant and that's exactly the same for people who have type 2 diabetes pre-diabetic high blood sugar level patients and also people with obesity if you are suffering from one or maybe more of those things. So it's going to be very likely that you have got a hormone imbalance, which is the reasons why insulin and glucagon are being spiked or being used too many times. And you've built up, your body has naturally built up a resistance or a tolerance to those hormones. So they don't work the same or your body doesn't receive the signal from those hormones the same. But I'm kind of slightly digressing. Let's go back to the pancreas here. When you consume too much energy or when you consume too much highly refined energy, let's say, for example, highly refined sugar, over a period of time, if that is done too many times, if that is consumed too many times, not just in one day, but over a period of, let's say, months, what will happen is, is that there'll be a backup of fat. And that backup of fat is basically because the amount of refined food that the individual's eating is being consumed so many times that the liver is not really keeping up with the demand. And so where the liver's job is to store body fat, uh, which is subcutaneous fat, which is around the torso and around the hips and the thighs, what happens is, is the liver can't keep up with the demand of so much refined rich sugars and grains and saturated fat so what happens is it has to store it and where it stores it it starts to store it in the muscle tissue and it starts to store it around the organs this intracellular fat or visceral fat will be stored in the places where it shouldn't be such as the pancreas now what happens is is because the pancreas creates these two hormones which is called glucagon and insulin it starts to become interrupted because the visceral fat or the intercellular fat inside the pancreas is disrupting normal operation of producing these two hormones. So originally, if you go back to the high blood sugar, you're spiking blood sugar a lot. And because you're spiking blood sugar too many times, or a type 2 diabetic will be spiking blood sugar too many times, which is why they've got type 2 diabetes. What happens is, is that that causes hyperinsulinemia. However, alongside that, 
as another side effect because the liver can't keep up with the amount of or the gross amount of sugar, refined grains and processed foods, it has to start to back it up into the pancreas. And so therefore, as a byproduct of that, the pancreas can't do its overall job because basically it's being stressed. It's being stressed out by the type of food and the diet and the lifestyle that the individual is living. So now you've got high blood sugar, you've got hyperinsulinemia, and then you go to the organ which produces insulin and glucagon. It can't do its job properly because it's being highly stressed with the amount of visceral fat that it has in, in that organ tissue. And that leads me really nicely on to the third red flag, which is a fatty liver or what we call a non-alcoholic fatty liver or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. A fatty liver is not a good thing. And again, as I say, it's the third red flag. But let's go back a couple of steps. We've addressed hyperinsulinemia and we've also addressed high blood sugar. Sugar doesn't metabolize in the same way that let's say a grain does. It has to go through a different process. So it, it goes through the bloodstream straight to the liver and the liver processes it and converts it into energy. More than likely, if it's, if it's being spiked too many times, yet the, the individual's consuming too much refined sugar, it basically gets stored as fat, okay? So your liver is basically just constantly pumping fat, subcutaneous fat, which is belly fat, into the fat cells. And it's trying to create more fat cells and store more in. But there's just too much of this refined food coming down from consumption. And so therefore, what the liver does is it starts to back up the fat in it within itself. So now your liver is starting to get this visceral fat. It's actually the same as the pancreas. So your organs are starting to carry too much stress because they're not designed and they shouldn't be carrying all this visceral fat. Yes, there will be some traces and, 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 and parts of the organs which have got fat in them for a healthy individual, but too much is putting too much stress on that organ. So if you are a type 2 diabetic, then you most likely will be suffering from all these four things, which is why you've got type 2 diabetes. If you're someone who's pre-diabetic or if you're someone who's got high blood sugar, I would definitely recommend that you start to look at those, those four red flags as potential culprits as to you being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes later on down the line. Sometimes when people are told, especially clients that I have worked with in the past, when they're told you've got high blood sugar, they don't take it that seriously. But actually... If you are told or you have been told that you've got your blood sugar is too high, it's a warning sign. And it's exactly the same for those who carry too much weight around their midsection. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that their blood sugar is going to be high, but it's very simple to get a blood test done um, just to see whether your blood sugar levels are a little bit a little bit too high. So we've discussed the four red flags of diabetes, but what would be the second stage or the next step in this process, in this discussion? Well, it would be two things. It would be medication and it would also be extreme dieting or just diets in general. Let's go to the medication first. I will break down medication a little bit more for you further along in this video, but I just want to give you a very general idea of the medication. So there are many medications that are available for type 2 diabetes. And to be quite honest with you, they all do a really very good job at controlling and managing diabetes. However, with medication, it's not a cure for diabetes. There is no cure for diabetes. The medication that type 2 diabetics are prescribed are there to be able to literally just control and keep the diabetes within a healthier range rather than allowing the diabetes to get worse and worse if left unmedicated. So type 2 diabetes medication is very much there to help support the individual and I'm a supporter of that type of medication. However, my argument always is going to be if the individual continues with the habits and the diets and the stress, then they're not actually going to change anything. And let's say that the medication is almost masking the problem because it's controlling it. Once you remove the medication, 
the problem quite often gets worse or has gotten worse because the medication over time has had to be dosed higher and higher. So when you first start on a medication such as metformin, you'll probably start on a, on a, a medium to low dose. But as time goes on and you don't change your habits and you don't change the way in which you eat and, and, and the nutrition that you choose to consume, On the other side of this, type 2 diabetics who decide to go on to very strict diets. I'm going to explain to you why diets aren't a good idea. And the basic reason that diets aren't a good idea is because they have not been designed for you as an individual. For example, let's say that you went on quite a famous diet like the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet isn't necessarily something that you would stick to and eat for a long period of time. The only way that true weight loss and bettering one's health, if you've got type 2 diabetes or you're obese, for example, the only way that you're going to better your health health and actually lose weight over a period of time is the longevity of change. So the longevity of change in terms of the things that you change over time, the habits the levels of stress, the types of food that you eat, and the, 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 the amount of times that you eat them, they're all going to compound into overall better health further down the line. However, again, with clients that I've worked with in the past, before they've come to me, they've actually tried to diet many, many times before. They've tried all sorts of different diets. Quite often, because of the age range of the clients that I tend to work with, which is probably the north of 60 to 65 a lot of people get these diets out of supplements within the newspaper and they give them a try now initially a diet will work for you because you've made a change you've made a change in your eating habits or your eating patterns or the types of food but and you'll lose let's say two and a half kilos just plucking a number out of the sky you'll lose some form of weight however that weight will kind of get to a point where it comes to a halt. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, is that there's a hormone imbalance, okay? So it's not just about the diet, it's about understanding the hormones. So when I'm working with my clients, I'm trying to teach them about their hormones so they have a really much, much vaster understanding of what's actually going on with their type 2 diabetes and also just their general health and their general weight. So those two things need to kind of be mentioned hand in hand the medication which is there to support you which i believe in by the way but at the same time if you're going to give people medication then you should really teach them about diet as well there's no point continuously catching a fish for a person if you can't teach them how to fish because they'll never learn how to catch a fish for themselves same with extreme dieting is that extreme dieting or diets in general just don't work and the basic reason is is because is they're not designed for you, they haven't been programmed for you, and also they don't address the imbalance of your hormones. So as I mentioned, I'm just going to choose a couple of very popular diabetic medications and also weight loss medications just to give you a general idea of what they do. So two quite popular medications, and you, you'll probably be on one of them, but you may not be on the other. The one you probably will be familiar with is a drug called metformin. It's very widely used. And the other drug that I'm going to choose is glycoside. So they both work slightly differently, but they both are there to achieve the same thing. They're both there to try and achieve controlled blood sugar so that it controls the type 2 diabetes. So metformin is a, a little bit of a better drug in, the, in, in a regard because it actually has some fat burning properties to it. So when a patient is taking metformin there probably is going to be a very very small reduction unless their diet is really terrible there's going to be a very small reduction in in actual weight loss um, and also fat tissue loss which does actually go to help the overall within the overall picture of 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 type 2 diabetes and also obesity and the reason that is is because it's encouraging the body to burn its reserves its fat stores Glycoside, on the other hand, doesn't quite do the same thing as metformin. It does control blood sugar levels, and it does it by influencing the pancreas to produce more insulin. And the more insulin that there is there produced, remember we talked about insulin slightly earlier before, is that insulin brings blood sugar levels back down. So it encourages more insulin production. 
So that's those two hormones, those two medications, sorry. If we move over to another uh, type of medication, which is weight loss medication, let's talk about Monjaro and Ozempic. So I actually did a video about Monjaro, which I'll link up here with a client. So in your body, you have got a vast list of hormones that all have got different jobs. So very, very simple. The, some of the most famous hormones that you will have heard about will be dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is there for drive and serotonin is there for strive. And if you strive to get something, then the reward is going to be that dopamine, that hit of dopamine, that hit of pleasure. Um, so GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1 and GIP is glucose dependent insulin otropic polypeptide. Now what these two hormones basically do is they are there to to help create satiety. So satiety basically means that when you consume food you feel fuller for longer and so it actually slows down the digestion. So when the food passes through the stomach and into the gut it basically slows that process down further so the individual actually feels fuller for longer. So they don't actually feel like going back to eating again later on down the line because they're still full from the initial meal. And also with the glucagon-like peptide 1, it's there to be stimulating more glucagon. So basically it puts a cap on glucagon. And again, glucagon is the hormone that raises blood sugar when blood sugar levels get too low and so that's what that hormone is there to do is there to suppress the glucagon slightly these are all natural hormones that are actually created within the gut but the drug monjuro actually uh, stimulates that th those hormones more so there's there's more free roaming availability of those hormones if you go up to the video that I've linked in, in, in this webinar, the client that I work with called Derek actually lost 10% of his overall body mass, which was absolutely huge. So those drugs do work. So you've got metformin and another drug such as glycoside, and they're there specifically to control type 2 diabetes. They're there to control the blood sugar levels. Then on the other side with the Ozempic and the Monjaro, they're both drugs that are there to help the individual lose weight and obviously weight loss is very much correlated with type 2 diabetes if you lose weight then you are going to help maintain control and sometimes sometimes you are actually able to reverse type 2 diabetes either down to pre-diabetes or high blood sugar or even lower depending on I guess the relationship with food, the drive of the individual, the coaching that that person's getting and, and, and their end goal in their mind. Okay, so we've gone through quite a lot in this webinar. We've gone through four red flags of diabetes, which are the high blood sugar, fatty pancreas, fatty liver, and also the hyperinsulinemia. We've also gone through medication and we've gone through sort of extreme dieting and they're both things that we need to consider when we're thinking about trying to do something for our health and then I've also given you a little bit of a breakdown of what diabetic drugs do and also what weight loss drugs do. Now I would like to move on to a little bit more of a personal part of this this webinar so you're probably wondering like how did you get into type 2 diabetes or why do you know so much about type 2 diabetes so about seven years ago, I qualified as a nutritionist. Just very briefly, I actually was diagnosed with anorexia when I was 17. And that took quite a few years to be able to come to terms with and get over. And so my understanding of nutrition has always come from a very personal place. Now, for me, I hadn't really worked or dealt with anyone with type 2 diabetes. However, my mum retired at 65. And when she was 66, she was actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which was a real shock for her because she was someone who just never got ill. She rarely got cold. Now she's facing having to go on to medication, which was metformin uh, initially. And actually her blood sugar levels were quite high. I can't remember the exact reading, but they were a significant, let's say. She's now been told and she's now been diagnosed with this disease of type 2 diabetes. So 
she was very much someone of the mindset who just didn't want the label of type 2 diabetes. She just didn't want it. Regardless of all the things that type 2 diabetes has got side effects, which are not very nice, which I will go into a little bit further on down this video. She just was someone who wanted better for herself. So I thought, well, that's fine. You know, I'm someone who has really qualified with nutrition. I understand nutrition. I understand how to give information over. So when I started with my mum, I was basically giving her the very basics of like, you know, understanding calories, understanding fats, understanding carbohydrates, understanding proteins. And nothing was happening, like nothing was, was changing at all. And so after a few months of deliberately trying to make things better, she wasn't really losing any weight whatsoever. There was no significant shift in, in, in her readouts or within the scales. So what I decided to do was I thought to myself, well, I'm going to take this on board a little bit more myself. So what I did is I sat down with her and I basically wrote out a list of all the food that she eats, everything from breakfast, lunch and dinner and everything else in between. Obviously, the things that I was like, well, that's not going to be good, such as, you know, a chocolate bar. We're going to cross that out and we're going to replace it with something. But what I did is I actually learned how to develop and create recipes for individuals. So there are a lot of things in there that are fine, but also some things in there that I wanted to remove from her diet over a period of time. The reason why it worked is because she actually agreed. She actually said, yes, I'm happy to replace that, but it's got to be with something else. And so that's what I did. I developed and designed a nutrition plan for her. And I also was coaching her along the way. Now, bear in mind, I was only one step ahead of her. So what I was teaching her, I'd only just learned myself. It wasn't exactly as if I was some sort of guru with type 2 diabetes, but I wanted to help my mum with her type 2 diabetes. Now, it took 18 months. And after 18 months, we actually got the all clear that her blood sugar levels were low enough to be able to come off of the metformin and that she was basically sort of put it back into remission. And she didn't have type 2 diabetes, nor did she have pre-diabetes, nor did she have high blood sugar. And actually, as a result of all her hard work and hard effort, she had actually lost quite a significant amount of weight as well. And she felt better. As I'm working closely with my mum, something really funny happens to me. So I get contacted by this guy, and his name is Andy. And I'll link Andy's video up in this video as well, in this, in this webinar, so that you can have a look at that. When I met Andy, Andy was basically coming to me rather than coming to me as a, a client for nutrition or coming to me as a client for personal training, because I also do personal training with clients, fitness exercises and things of that nature. He came to me as a type 2 diabetic and he basically said, I don't know if you can help me, but I'd like to try and address my type 2 diabetes. So as a very brief background, Andy, Andy was 36 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. Diabetes had been in his all of his family, especially his mum and his dad. Unfortunately for Andy, he'd actually lost his dad at a very young age to type 2 diabetes. And before Andy's dad passed on, they actually had to amputate one of his legs. And that is because of what we were speaking about, about that, that dead tissue, because the blood isn't oxygenating that tissue anymore because there's too much blood sugar readily available in, in the bloodstream. So... It's very hard hitting for Andy. He's had, he's actually lost someone to type 2 diabetes. His mum and his siblings have got type 2 diabetes um, and he just doesn't want that. Also on the other side of it, you know, he's relatively newly married. He's just had his first child and he's also just opened his first business. And so in amongst all those things, he really doesn't need the extra stress of having type 2 diabetes. So with Andy, what we did is I, I basically applied what I applied to my mum. I it was it was weird how it happened because I was working with my mum at the time and Andy kind of just came out of nowhere. I had been recommended by another client and that's how he got in contact with me. However, it was because Andy had only just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes quite early on. Although his levels were quite high. He was very willing to do something about it. He wanted to take on a fitness regime. He wanted to, you know, restructure his diet. 
And I'm not going to lie and say it was really easy to do. It wasn't. It was took a lot of coaching and it took a lot of time for him to really understand the importance of whole foods and replacing those refined foods with those whole foods. However, I believe that we started working in the October and by the following February, Andy actually came to me and he said, I've reversed my type 2 diabetes. I no longer have type 2 diabetes. My blood sugar levels have gone right low. Now, that's probably due to the fact that his weight loss coincided with that. When you've got weight loss and you change your diet and you change your habits around your diet and you also learn to manage and control your stress levels, I will stress to you that stress levels are really something not to be ignored. However, Andy was the same. And I've got one more final client for you just to share this story. I worked with a client called John. and I still work with John to this day. And John, unfortunately, was diagnosed with cancer. And John's journey wasn't a, a good journey with, with his cancer. Unfortunately, his medication made him incredibly ill. He was bedridden for a long time. So when he came to me initially, he came to me as a personal trainer because he wanted to actually strengthen up his body because he said that he'd been lying in bed for weeks and weeks ill with cancer and also the, the the treatment that comes along with cancer. As a side effect of some of the drugs that John was taking, um, it gave him type 2 diabetes. So he was a, a sort of a mid to low pre-diabetic, just verging on the side of di type 2 diabetes. So when we're looking at diabetes, you're basically going off an HbA1c reading. And the HbA1c reading is basically anything up to 5.9. If you're getting to that level, is a little bit too high and that's high blood sugar and then once you're getting to 6 to 6.4 that's considered pre-diabetes and anything past 6.4 is type 2 diabetes and I've known clients who've gone all the way up to 18 nor past 18 which is when they're suggested that they need to start injecting insulin so John came to me he had cancer when we addressed his diet and there were quite a lot of things to address in his diet even though he ate very well there were lots of snacks and lots of refined sugary foods that actually he still ate and so we tried to wind those things down another thing that actually was a little bit of a, a, an issue for John was the amount of alcohol that he was consuming every single week and so we actually knocked the alcohol right down to a very minimal amount of units per week which I do believe actually had a positive effect, not only on his liver and his kidneys, but also on the type 2 diabetes. So we tested John, and John didn't actually reverse his type 2 diabetes, but he took it down from 6.4, so as I say, just verging on the pre-diabetes slash type 2 diabetes threshold there, and we actually lowered it all the way back down to 6, okay? So we did, we did well. He's got high blood sugar, but we're actually doing a lot better. The reason why I mentioned John is because of the fact that he had cancer. Now, I have to be careful what I say here because there is no actual real hard scientific evidence to prove this. However, when you're looking at cancer and you look at a cancer cell, a cancer cell is an individual cell that basically needs food and it needs somewhere to grow or it needs to grow. And the two things it needs are sugar or blood sugar or glucose. And the other thing that it needs is it needs insulin, which is the hormone that we've been speaking about in this webinar. And they're the two things that actually help stimulate cancer cells, mutated cells that are cancerous cells. I do think that there's going to be a very strong link, a very strong correlation to not only type 2 diabetes and medication, but to cancer and medication and how going forward in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we're actually going to start to implement personalized diets into you know, medication regimes or prescriptions of medication along with a personalized diet which is there to very much help the medication act and also help the individual to deal with controlling their their cancer because cancer is something that needs to be fed and it also needs to be stimulated to to mutate and some of the things that it uses it it, it does use sugar as its preference 
and it also uses one of the stimulators, which is insulin. So that's the reason why I bring that up, because if you look at people who've got type 2 diabetes, as a statistic, if you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you're going to be 25% more likely to get cancer. The fourth most highest rates of cancer worldwide are obesity. So if you're someone who is obese, again, you f you're, you're now in the fourth highest category to, to be able to mutate cells or develop mutated cells and, and get cancer. Um, and so I think it's a good enough reason to start to address your type 2 diabetes and also just to address your health in general. Okay, guys, so thank you for listening to those personal stories that I wanted to share with you. Obviously, the original one is of me and my mum, and then my first client, Andy, who is fantastic. And again, I still work with Andy to this day, and he has changed his life around completely. So as well as cancer risk, there are a few other things that you need to know about type 2 diabetes when it comes to risk of health. And those things are nerve damage, they're also erectile or sexual dysfunction. They're also shortness of breath. They're also going to exacerbate any cardiovascular problems that you've got. Um, and they're going to interrupt things such as your sleep. The reason why your sleep is interrupted is because diabetics are constantly getting up to urinate. So they're urinating frequently. And the reason why they're urinating frequently is because the body is trying to get rid of the sugar. And so what it does is it uses the urine, the, the, the urinary threshold to be able to get rid of that. So it, it basically excretes urine more frequently to try and lower the blood sugar. So rather than something such as, you know, high amounts of urination or frequent urination for the individual, Rather than looking at it as a side effect, actually what it is, is the body is trying to cure a problem. The body's trying to get on top of a problem and it's using its own availability of systems such as, you know, the urinary threshold to be able to extract and get rid of that extra glucose, which is rich in the blood. Nerve damage and things, they're all not necessarily side effects, but they're actually results of what the individual's doing to themselves, probably without knowing it. And... They're things that the body's trying to maintain and manage. Okay, so whenever you get these nasty health side effects along with type 2 diabetes or obesity, the body's trying its best to come back to equilibrium. I would always stress that. The body will always try to come back to equilibrium. The body's main job, its principal job, is to keep you alive, to keep itself alive. And so it's always going to try and find harmony. But it's your responsibility with the types of food and everything like that, the stress that you look after that so that it can do its job well. So I've given you that information and I hope that that's helpful, but I want to give you a little bit more, a little bit further information for you to take home from this webinar. What are the things that you can do right now to, to make changes? So I'm going to give that to you from a, a perspective of a coach who's working with a client. So if I can give you just a few things that will benefit you, the first thing that I would ask you to think about is changing the foods that you eat. Now, I know that sounds obvious because you probably think, well, I know that. But it's actually easier said than done, very much so. Like I said previously, there are no diets that really work for you because they're not designed for you. They are just an idea of how to reduce energy intake. And as we've seen in studies before, reducing energy intake in terms of reducing calories isn't going to be the thing that actually repairs your type 2 diabetes. It's got to be more addressed than that. If you're reducing the energy that you're eating, let's say you're reducing your calories, but you're still eating very refined foods, then it, it, it's, it doesn't really matter. You have to address the fact that you've got a hormone imbalance. If you've got type 2 diabetes, one of the things that you're going to have is a hormone imbalance. If you can start to choose more whole foods, okay, that's going to be very much something that's going to be a good start. I always feel, and I've worked with quite a lot of type 2 diabetics over the years, and one of the things that I feel is that unfortunately for those who have chosen to consume foods which are sort of slightly highly processed or not very good for them and they're not sticking to the whole foods I also feel that there is a link to having a damaged gut microbiome 
because your gut microbiome is there to produce some of those hormones which are designed to control and sustain weight. So that's going to be one of the initial things that you take on board is that when you do change your diet, you need to stick to it. So it's got to be something that you enjoy. Recipes and types of food that you really enjoy, but those types of food must steer away from refined sugars, refined grains, highly saturated fat. There is actually nothing wrong with saturated fat. It's just that if you're having huge quantities of it, well, your body's got to do something with that energy. So that's the first thing, types of food. The second thing is the regularity of how you eat. So the regularity of how you eat, a lot of people know that to be intermittent fasting. I think that intermittent fasting really does work. And all of my clients are on intermittent fasting now because I just had such great results with it. If I can give you a very easy guide to intermittent fasting, again, with IF, it's a structure of a diet and that structure may not necessarily suit you yet. And what I mean by that is, is that if you take on intermittent fasting and you do it seven days a week, then it's probably going to be a little bit overwhelming for you initially because you're a newbie. You're just getting started. You're just trying out things. So with intermittent fasting, what I would suggest doing is just doing two days a week and you're eating within an eight-hour window. Now, ideally, over time, you'd either start to expand the number of days that you're intermittent fasting or you start to narrow the window of time. So time is a huge part of how hormones are regulated and how weight is horm- is regulated by those hormones. So if you can control the amount of intake that you have throughout the day in a smaller, narrow, win- narrower window of time or a multitude of those windows throughout the week, then what you're going to find is that your hormones eventually will start to come back to some form of balance. The other things that I'd like you to take away are three types of food or two macronutrients and, and, and one other. The two macronutrients that you really want to look out for are fat and protein. Fat can be saturated or unsaturated fat. I'm very much a fan of animal meats and animal fats. However, if you're not someone who likes that type of food or you don't eat that type of food, then I suggest that you stick to more to stick to things more such as coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil and make sure it's the extra virgin olive oil even though it's a little bit more expensive it's actually going to benefit you further and also natural butter either salted or unsalted butter and the reason is is because fat acts as a buffer to the spike of insulin so if you were to consume fat within your meal the insulin is going to find it harder to get through and that leads me on to protein now protein in today's day and age in the 21st century Proteins pushed in front of us through marketing as, you know, oh, high in protein this and high in protein that and high in protein the other. In my complete honest opinion, dietary protein is the only thing that you should be consuming when it comes to protein. I used to love protein shakes personally, but I don't consume them anymore because it's refined powder and it has the same effect. It just what it just whacks up your insulin. I actually did a constant glucose monitor, a CGM, for a couple of weeks and I couldn't understand why my my glucose was so high. What well, was high? All my insulin levels were my glucose levels were high because I was consuming very refined sugary protein powder, and it was my protein shakes so are actually spiking my insulin and spiking my blood glucose. So when it comes to dietary protein, they're the types of protein that you wanna you wanna look at, and you can also include things such as cheese and things such as eggs and and fish. It doesn't all have to be meat based. So fats and protein. And the third one is fiber, dietary fiber. Now, I'm a big fan of vegetables. I think that everyone should be consuming vegetables. If you find it hard to consume that type of food is to dress it up and to make it interesting. And that's probably where you need recipes to kind of help you or a little bit of experience preparing and cooking this food, this type of food. When it comes to fiber, don't go down the route of fruit. Don't, I'm not saying avoid fruit, have your fruit, but do not consume too much fruit because fruit obviously has got fructose in it and fructose is going to start to go back to this problem of hyperinsulinemia. And I've actually got a client who actually came to me 
with weight issues. And the reason why his weight issues were so bad is because he decided to purely just eat fruit and drink smoothies. And that's all he did all day. And his sugar intake was absolutely phenomenal. And that's why he put on so much weight. Help increase, obviously, the amount of fiber that you consume. And that fiber, again, like the dietary protein and the dietary fat, that fiber is going to buffer that insulin. So if you're having high amounts of protein, high amounts of reasonable amounts of dietary fat and a decent amount of fiber in your diet or just in one meal, you're going to really slow down that spike of insulin. And that's going to help control your blood sugar levels further. And that's going to go to help you losing weight. And it's also going to help you to control your type 2 diabetes. So guys, if you've made it to the end of the video, then well done. You obviously care about your type 2 diabetes and you care about your health. I'm going to put my website link in the bottom in the comments box. And I'm also going to put my email address. And I'm also going to put a another link in, which is basically a scorecard. Now, what I say to you is, is that even if you just want a little bit of friendly advice, then you're more than welcome just to pop me a message, just copy the email and then just send it to me and I will reply to you if you just got a simple query. If you want to, you can go onto my website and find out a little bit more about how I coach type 2 diabetics and how I work with type 2 diabetics. So if you click on the button on my website, press the link below. If you click on the button, take the scorecard, it will take you to a scorecard which is based around type 2 diabetes and it and also it gives you a score about your type 2 diabetes and where you are within type 2 diabetes it's a questionnaire basically that i have designed that is there to be able to give you some structure around your type 2 diabetes bit by bit to try and get a better understanding of what you need to do to be able to control and reduce the effects of type 2 diabetes. 